so I'm going to talk about a little more of like a 1 to 100 journey. Uh, you probably have heard a lot of the 0 to 1 stories, and you'll continue here. You have Kevin Rose later, which is going to be dope for you all. So um, my background is basically in the creator economy, and then, you know, I didn't read some like Bitcoin white paper that changed my life to get into crypto. I got really in because of digital ownership and being a gamer. Uh, so yeah, I'm at Polygon Labs now and uh, spent my time at YouTube before in the creator economy and have just been a diehard gamer my whole life. So as a little kid, just, you know, you know, shit posting in, uh, you know, Counter-Strike and Quake and Team Fortress Classic and just really becoming a gamer uh, through and through, uh, dialing up the dial-up era, 56K modem, uh, you know, 300 ping, got really into PC gaming. That ultimately led me to, in college, playing competitively. So played Call of Duty competitively, and then when I was in college, I'm like, I got to figure out uh, a real job, you know, that makes money, because esports hadn't really turned into anything meaningful. There was really no money to be had. It was like beer money on the weekends at Ohio State. Uh, so uh, there was more to do. So I started streaming. Not a lot of money in streaming at the time. It was just in TV. Nobody was really making any money off of it. And so I said, all right, college is coming to an end. I really got to figure out how I get a job in this industry, in the gaming industry. And so I, I got hooked on this idea that I enjoyed trying to find content of, you know, World of Warcraft videos or Counter-Strike montages, you know, and got into this idea that other people might like watching gaming videos. Now, it was a little bit crazy of a concept because at the time, everyone was saying, nobody wants to watch people play video games. It's like a stupid ass idea. People want to play video games. And that did resonate a little bit because I remember my older brother when he had the controller I'd always be like, dude, I, I want to play. Like, I don't want to watch you play anymore. And so sometimes I doubted myself, but I said, hey, let's go on this journey of figuring out if people want to watch people play video games. And so that's what I did. Um, and it was funny because in the esports days, it kind of, you saw it, this whole idea of people watching people play video games starting to emerge. It, and there was all kind of things that were happening around us that, of things that were changing. You know, at these uh, MLG LAN events that we would do, one thing was like the CRT monitors for Halo, just big TV screens that we would have to bring in. Then all of a sudden, you know, the LCD screens came out. And then, you know, uh, internet bandwidth, like CDN costs were so expensive to upload that we couldn't actually stream content from the ballroom. That ended up getting cheaper over time. And so there was a lot of these great technological breakthroughs that were starting to happen uh, in the space. And so I worked at a startup called Machinima. It got acquired by Warner Brothers. I then worked at Major League Gaming. It got acquired by Activision Blizzard. And so Google Ventures had invested in Machinima and had seen some of the stuff we were doing around gaming video. And Google at the time was looking to hire the first head of gaming at YouTube because Twitch had just acquired Amazon. YouTube was really behind on the gaming wars. Um, obviously, they didn't get to acquire Twitch. And so Susan Wojcicki, the CEO at the time, said, look, we got to focus on this vertical and come in. So they tapped me, which was exciting uh, for me as an opportunity. I was 27 years old to come in as the head of gaming at YouTube. I had definitely a little bit of imposter syndrome, uh, it being in the room with a bunch of older execs. Um, and I think the one thing that I was able to realize, though, was there was a lot that I could learn from them, and there was a lot that they could learn from me about really what does it take to be a creator, what does it look to be in this space. And so one of the things that, I, you know, like I was talking about is we had to actually bet on a bunch of things that we had no control over. So by that, it was, yeah, we have this video platform, people can upload videos. Uh, yeah, we are gonna be able to sell pre-roll advertising. Um, but then there was a bunch of factors that didn't come out. So how do you actually get people to upload gameplay? Well, we barely have any monetization tool because at the time we only had pre-roll ads. It was really hard and cumbersome to capture video content. You, you basically had to wait for the rise of uh, this Dazzle capture card that let people plug their Xbox or PlayStation directly in, start capturing content. Streaming was almost impossible because you needed two PCs, you needed an upload speed that could actually hold it, and the reason the streaming business was just a terrible business because economically it didn't make sense. You couldn't drive the ad revenue to cover the CDN cost for live streaming infrastructure. So it was all bad, but you had to keep persisting, right? Because everyone was telling you, it's like, none of these things are working. You know, you're not going to be able to stream content. It's too expensive. The economics don't work. People don't want to watch gaming videos. It's not going to work. And Ultimately, we started to break through some of these barriers and building out, you know, the team and some of the things that we had to face were basically, you know, we had at YouTube nobody that understood gaming. There wasn't a team that existed. 
There was no plan on who we target, how we build, how we target getting gaming creators, how we get gaming publishers and developers leaned in, how we get people buying advertising against gaming content. The other big uh, problem that we were facing was with YouTube, we were a broad video platform, and now verticalized uh, specialists were coming in. So music was getting you know, attacked by Spotify, gaming obviously with Twitch and Microsoft Mixer and Facebook Gaming and all these platforms. And so we had to think about building vertical specific products, but they had to be broadly applicable to everybody as well, which is kind of a conundrum when you're trying to be vertical specific, but you don't want to waste product and engineering resources so that whatever you're doing has to somehow apply to everybody. And it worked, right? We did things like channel level memberships. We did digital goods. Uh, we ended up, you know, in the, in the height of mobile viewing, rolled out mobile mid rolls and really uh, started to educate our sales teams on how they could sell gaming at mass. So a lot of that was fun, great. Spent about eight years there. 450 million people log in, watch gaming content every day. It makes it the largest gaming platform in the world, generates billions of dollars for YouTube, one of the largest verticals. And it's about 85% of the entire industry's gaming watch time actually is on YouTube gaming because we really focused on VOD and short content and live as well. But live was something that it was in everybody's mind as a big thing. But on paper, when you looked at watch time, actually didn't, a lot, didn't drive much revenue or watch time overall. So during that time, I was like, I got really fascinated with this idea of digital ownership. We were spending a lot of time at YouTube looking at things like Roblox, where these games went from highly complimentary to driving watch time on YouTube to being a little antagonistic, because there's a finite amount of time that people have in a day, and instead of watching gaming videos, they were going and playing, playing Roblox, playing Minecraft. And so these same games that had helped us grow started to be somewhat competitive as far as just people's t you know, uh, time that they have in a day on entertainment. And during that journey, we spent a lot of time on how much people were spending on digital products, right? Gaming, obviously, very specific. And so that got me thinking, yeah, the way that we purchase and interact and buy today is not going to be significant enough. And so Counter-Strike is one of my games that I've played 20 years, still play it today. They're about as close to setting up a faux Web3 environment where you can buy skins, you can trade them. Uh, you can sell them, but wasn't quite there. Still wall garden, still had to rely on third-party websites that are violating terms of service in order to like buy and trade offline off the Steam store, outside of the Steam store. So I felt like there's something that needs to happen here. So I looked around the space of um, where I wanted to be, and I, I chose to go to Polygon. Um, and, I, and I was most excited about Polygon because I felt that they actually had the ability to scale the infrastructure. And so I started learning more about the space, and, and I have to give a shout out to the first crypto school here because it's where I started to learn about the space. Again, I didn't have any of these kind of crypto moments or enlightening moments up until digital ownership, and so I went down the rabbit hole of uh, CSS. So thank, thank you for this place. And digital ownership became the kind of like core focus for me. And the reason why I wanted to jump in the space was I felt there was this moment in time that we had really hit an inflection point in Web3 and blockchain. Uh, one, I felt that really from a user perspective, if you look at just the value of the user, they do not own what they purchase in the digital environment today, and that's like very problematic. And as they spend more, they're going to want more autonomy and ownership over things. And the current infrastructure and systems don't enable that to happen. So I just fundamentally believe that you had to disrupt the intermediary and actually establish these businesses on a blockchain. Two, I felt that the infrastructure, it's not there yet, but was starting to be in a place where it will be able to scale. So none of the protocols really scale right now. And they don't really have to right now at this point, right? There's not enough transactions happening. There's not enough dApps that are being built on it. But I felt that with Polygon, with the acquisitions that we had made, we had spent a billion dollars across three different ZK teams that we brought in-house. And felt that with ZK and some of the work that we'll do over the next couple of years, we actually are in a place where we can now have dApps that are building on top of the protocol actually can do with, deal with the volume and scale that we'll start to see over the next three, four, or five years as more uh, adoption happens. I think the other thing too is in general, philosophically for me, I always just felt in order to do your like, best work, you have to be like, where can you drive high impact? So whether it's you're starting your company or wherever you're focused, like you truly have to get up every day and be, what am I, if, if, and what am I doing going to drive like the highest impact on a day-to-day basis? And then lastly, I just felt that there was this unique opportunity to level up Web3, particularly on the infrastructure side, to start to work with bigger companies, bigger enterprises, get them excited, start talking about digital ownership, start talking about blockchain. 
And so when I joined Polygon uh, January of last year, you know, the one thing was, okay, how do we bring some of the things that are complementary to Web 2 into Web 3? What are the goods of Web? What are the good things of Web 2 and the bad things of Web 2 that we want to bring over or not bring over into the Web 3 space? And so for those of you, if you're familiar with Polygon, we have far and away established the largest presence and uh, partnerships in Fortune 500 enterprise companies. A lot of our ability to do that has been with, one, a very specific focus on exactly what we want to do and go after. Two, having a team that's very well-rounded of people that get the Web3 space that are really endemic, but also have the polished prestige leadership skill sets that they've developed over the last decade to be able to run effective organizations and teams. And because of that, we've partnered with, you know, you name it, all of these large companies. And yeah, some of them are in varying degrees, like some of them small NFT project where they're just like tinkering on the R&D side to just, what is this Web3, what is NFTs? Uh, things like Disney, which was an accelerator program that spawned other work that we're doing with them that we can't quite share yet, um, and all kinds of partnerships. And so, I want to talk a little bit about what we did to establish that team over the last year and a half, because basically all of 2022 is where we really went on a, on a rip of bringing a lot of these folks on board. And we made a handful of bets across a handful of categories. So one thing that we really believe as far as early adoption that will be really exciting is loyalty and rewards. We just kind of felt that one area where people don't have the ownership that they should is in that category. So we started working with Starbucks. And Starbucks, um, I mean, out of any of the Web3 or Web2 companies that we work with, they get it the most. Uh, Starbucks actually, it was the former chief digital officer who's at Forum3 that kind of came up with this idea of how do we expand on the idea of loyalty and rewards. And so that spawned Starbucks Odyssey. It's in beta. They're basically running a parallel rewards program. They call it stamps, it's NFTs. They're kind of working to figure out how do these worlds converge at one point. Reddit was a great example of people that hate NFTs, Web3, um, and can we actually approach them with a different angle? Where it's like, don't think about these apes selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars, don't think about kind of all the things that are happening in NFTs, which like 98% of the stuff happening in NFTs was terrible. Um, and so we really talked to them about a different understanding of digital ownership. And so they, oh, all right, digital collectibles, not NFTs, I like this idea, tell me more. And 8 million users later have been now onboarded into Web3 in kind of what you would call a Web 2.5 way. It's on Polygon, they, everything happens on Polygon, but all the crypto jargon and the user journey is all really abstracted away. Um, so they really don't, might not even realize that they're operating and actually interacting with the blockchain, which I think is awesome. And I actually think as you think about scaling and us getting to 100 million, 200 million users, a lot of that stuff needs to be abstracted away. And I think people are making progress on it. If you look at wallets and marketplaces, the user journey is getting a little bit better and not so cumbersome. Another big gap that we had was creator economy. So when we looked at kind of the like PFP creator space in the beginning of 22, we just weren't in a good spot. We weren't in a good spot because we didn't have marketplaces set up that you could actually, you know, if you were a Polygon project, you could be on. Um, we didn't have all the wallets that were supporting us that people loved. And so we had a lot of different gaps where we had this like problem where we couldn't get a cold start problem for the creator economy. And so the first thing that we did, instead of going after any kind of projects to try to jumpstart that, was let's improve the on-ramps into the Polygon ecosystem. So we announced partnerships with Phantoms, Great Wallet, Magic Eden, and obviously we did go pretty aggressive in general towards you know, uh, like Solana's ecosystem because they had an incredible user journey, they had an incredible creator ecosystem, and that was actually something that we were really missing. And so we started you know, establish a lot of different marketplaces, wallets, and then you have the on-ramps, but you still don't have any of the magic. And so we worked with Utes, which was a very successful PFP project that was on Solana, we had them bridge their project over, and it's really not the project that matters at all. It's actually not important. What we brought over was creators that are respected in the industry and that category, and they're gonna do a launch pad so that they can empower other creators to create projects and content. And so we felt that this would give us a little bit to jumpstart the ecosystem. Ultimately, you have to, you know, cultivating a community takes a lot of nurturing, it takes time, it takes investment, it takes development, you can't buy a community, but we looked at this as one of many things that we needed to do to get that catalyst going. Then we thought about it from a, you know, we're a decentralized protocol, and long term, our contributor group, Polygon Labs, needs to spend more or less and less time driving impact to that protocol. And so we looked at the space and said, where are we making big bets? Well, gaming 
We care a lot. Obviously, I'm biased there, but we care a lot about gaming. And so Immutable was this middleware provider where a lot of games were drawing uh, traction because they kind of have an end-to-end -end service. Wallet, APIs, marketplace, very easy to develop and launch a game on their stack. The problem is they weren't EVM compatible and they were on Starkware. Starkware is an amazing protocol and project, by the way. But they really wanted to go into EVM compatibility and their issue was, hey, we're losing a lot of gaming partnerships because of our lack of, a v of EVM compatibility. For us, it was very complimentary because we said, look, long term, this contributor group of Polygon Labs needs to drive less and less and less impact. It has to be driven by large revenue driving businesses that are on the protocol. And so we partnered with Immutable. Um, and Immutable is basically going to spin up a dedicated SuperNet chain, which is our ZK uh, dedicated app chains. And they're working on it now. It'll be launched in the new year. And so gaming projects will not be launched on there. It's a Matic staked chain, uh, gases through IMX. And then the last big beat that we made um, was Nexon. Nexon's one of the largest game publishers in the world. Uh, they have a, a game called MapleStory Universe, has 180 million users. They too are building a dedicated app chain on Polygon uh, as well. And so I say all of this because a big theme of what I, I, I focus on you know, right now is you've got to like build a team, build a culture, identify where you want to make big bets, and then how you go to market. And this is kind of like the team we built, and these were the bets that we made. And so there's three things when coming into Polygon, you know, you had already seen a company do a tremendous job going from zero to one. They had raised $450 million. Um, they had really the team and talent there, but it was a scrappy Web3 native team. And now they were trying to figure out, like, how do we really grow this presence? How do we become more global? And so a big focus was when I came in was, all right, how do we have a more diverse background and representation across the, the team? We had a lot of Web3 endemic folks, and that was great but it led to some of the same decisions and outcomes. Some were good, some that were not. And so we wanted to bring in a variety of different folks that could bring different perspective and that had different tenure in the space. This is a hard part. This is like much easier said than done because you are in that, in, in that hyper growth phase, you're actually disrupting people that were in roles that already had a, a thought process, that already a frame of reference of what the company can be, what it will be. And so it's disruptive, but important. Um, Another thing that we really learned was you really have to live it. In this space, it's so nascent. Um, if you're not like living and breathing it every day, it feels like work all the time. So we had people that came to Polygon with this idea of, oh, it's like it could be the next Google, and it's in tech, and it's fun, and I should go do this. But they didn't really live Web3. They didn't think about it. They hadn't really reoriented their mind culturally about how this space works, how the community works. And them trying to pick it up became such a work. Like, they had to spend time after work to, in order to understand it. They had to spend time reading on the weekends. And everyone does that that's in the space, but if that's not something you enjoy, that feels like a lot of work. Um, and, and this one's more of a learning. I would say this is not what we didn't, we didn't start with this mentality of you have to live it. It was something we learned through our mistakes. And then big bets. I think people get scared to make big bets. Um, do you make them too early? Do you make the right ones? Can you actually fulfill it? And I, and I think you should have a little bit of nervousness and, and, and be a little scared to make big bets, but you have to do it, right? And so I'll talk a little bit about kind of the framework that we use when we think about it. So hiring, really you should not, like do not mess up hiring. I can't tell you, like there are things that you can do where you mess up and you can pivot quickly, whether it's a product idea, whether it's trying a feature, you can mess around, you can try it, you can fail fast. You cannot hire fast and then like you're in a tough spot. Because the problem with hiring fast too is once you've brought those people in, undoing that work is really, really, really difficult. Um, so first we had to go and look at the organization and say, where do we just have like very obvious gaps? So we spent time looking at where were things that we, we had great ZK, we had great cryptographers. We didn't have kind of the BD, go-to-market, partnerships, marketing components built out, legal, finance, people teams. All of this needed a lot of work, so we really had to fill these gaps in. But again, couldn't do it on a quick, uh, despite the urgency, didn't want to do it quickly. We really had to build out core competencies within our leadership group. Again, you're trying to find folks that have experience, but also understand where we're directionally going with Web3. And so this was easier, easy to identify, but hard to build out. Um, not rushing hiring was a big one. I think particularly where we were at, it was like the height of the bull market as well. 
and all of like, what are the other protocols doing? What are the other companies doing? What everybody else is doing? Hire this person, hire this person. We got to bring this person in. We're behind here. And it led to just a series of bad decisions. Uh, you rush. And what happens is when you rush, you might not find the right person. You might overpay the person. You might start to fragment your culture one hire at a time. And in these formative years, when you're a smaller organization, it literally takes one bad hire to really throw off a team, a company, so forth. And so you should be spending time with people, four or five people, different people interviewing these individuals, figuring out if they're a right culture fit. Let them go if it doesn't feel right. Don't rush it. Uh, long term, people that bring in bad hires, it's an impossible thing to unwind. It's very cumbersome from a legal people perspective and everything else. And then organizational structure. So on organizational structure, I think there's been a lot that we've learned. One, um, you've got to be incredibly fluid, and it's okay to change your organization a lot. People that come into a new company and they don't like all that organizational change should not be working at a startup because things are constantly changing in this environment and even 10x so in crypto and Web3, where it's like every day is a different day than the day before. And so, yes, you should be able to change and be very fluid, but I think how you communicate and having tact with your organization and team, bringing them along on why you're making these changes, what the logic is behind it, how you do it in a way uh, that isn't rash and, and doesn't, you know, you don't want to be a, a bull in a china shop either as well. And so being very thoughtful about it is important, but don't be afraid to do it. Um, you have to raise the bar too. I think this is one thing where you, if you rush hiring as well, you start to deviate away from like a level of talent that you want to withhold. Like you really do want to calibrate an organization to be high delivery only. Do not let B and C players come into your company. It's not worth it. Take the time to focus these right folks. Because then you have people that are truly inspired. They show up, they're excited to work every day at the company. They know that their peers are going to make them better. Um, and they really feel like they're getting pushed every single day. Uh, this is also a thing, once you start to lower your, your level of talent, that is the talent that you will operate at. You cannot fix that. It's, you're, you, get, you end up getting stuck. So as you, get, as you get bigger, you start to do performance reviews. You calibrate those individuals against basically your C and B players. And so hold a very high bar from day one. Don't, don't deviate from it. And then silos. I think another thing that you'll see in organizational changes, people that are very just like selfish and focused, they just want to focus on what can I own? What title can I have? How many people can I manage on my team? And when you make changes that disrupt that, they dig, they dig their heels in, they become kind of combative and disruptive, get rid of those people. But just like you should not have those people inside of your organization. They're not thinking long term. They're not thinking in the best interests of the company. They don't, they don't have a mentality of we should do whatever it takes to win. If we think this organizational change is the best thing for us to win, then let's make that change. The other thing too about it is people that are playing a longer term game know the fluidity of the organization. So they know there'll be an opportunity for them to take on things in the future, that there's just a moment in time that maybe they lost a particular team or group that went to another group. And so they're also not even, not only is it like selfishly motivated, they're just short term thinkers. And you just don't want anybody, especially in this industry where we're playing a long game to be myopic. That you got to live it part was this, again, this is where we learned the most. So we made a big mistake. I made a big mistake where I projected a little bit that everybody that I would bring in from web two was going to have the same enthusiasm and, enthusiasm and fire and belief in web three and digital ownership that I had. Um, and so if I had to do it again, I'd still focus on bringing web two folks in, but I would have went back to one of my principles on the calibration. Um, and so a lot of the things that you really do want to ask yourself in this process is just like, how is your cult, how's the culture different in Web3? And I think, again, because of these nascent industries, these are kind of prerequisites. You know, people need to be able to have a perspective of what Web3 means. Where do we think users are going in this space? Why are developers believing and building in this space? Uh, what do we need to do as a decentralized protocol to ultimately take our hands off the wheel? All of these things are very fundamentally different than anything you ever learn in business school or about corporations. If you think about Polygon Labs, if our goal is to continue to be more and more decentralized, which it is, it means that contributor group is gonna be smaller and smaller and smaller every single year let's say over the next decade. And so when you come into the company and you think it's gonna be like the next Google, so you're like, oh, it's this size and it's gonna get bigger and bigger and then I can run a big team one day and do all of this, you've lost kind of the mission and the spirit of what Polygon Labs is and what we're focused on. And so it's really, really important to be very, like people talk all the time, will come up here and be like, culture's really important. It's like, yeah, obviously. But 
I think it's really, really important more than anything of like, why do you work here? Like, why are you showing up at Polygon Labs every day? Are you here for a paycheck? Are you here because you believe in decentralization? Are you here because you think Polygon's the best protocol? What is it? What gets you up? Why do you get here? Obviously, you want to maintain a, a culture and identity with inside of your company. That's a no-brainer. But I do think making sure that you know why everybody shows up every single day to work is really, really important. Um, and the learning curve, like this is where we talk, this is where we actually learned a lot about why this was really important because you do have to dedicate a lot of time in this space because there is no blueprint, there's no playbook, like nobody's ever done any of this stuff before. You can draw inspiration, there are things you can learn from others that have done things in the space, but there is no blueprint for any of you, including us on the protocol side. So we're like, we're all learning from each other in real time. You're going to learn from your customers, you're going to learn from other developers, it's nonstop. And because there's so much capital in this space that has been injected, there's so much happening at a rapid pace, it's very hard to stay on top of everything. And so you spending time outside of just even building to stay on top of it is really important. We've even had this issue internally where we're heads down on, you know, like our ZKVM protocol, and you look up and you realize gas costs right now are not going to cut it. Like developers and users are not going to use the protocol at the current gas costs. It's like problematic, right? And so you realize, oh, this is actually what my customers want, and you have to pivot, right? And so for us, reducing gas costs goes from like to a researcher and engineer from like P3 to a P0 um, immediately. Um, really immersing yourself in the community. This one is so interesting. In most fields, you don't have to like live on Discord, live on Twitter, live on these different spaces. You actually really do um, need to because again, to the first point, the space is so dynamic, really important. And you should be begging for feedback all the time. Like, why don't you build on our protocol? Why don't you build on our app? Why don't you build whatever the case may be? All the time, nonstop. And that really should be informing your product decisions and prioritization and roadmap. At the end of the day, you're just building for customers. So we have not done always great at this, but have really tried to make sure that culturally focus less on what other L2s and L1s are doing all the time and focus on just like what is the gap inside of our protocol? Like why are people not building or are building with us? Um, and then, yeah, I think the other thing is, <laughs> I don't think in general people do enough is postmortems. Bad BD deals, bad product decisions, uh, bad prioritization. Nobody ever wants to go back and revisit and relitigate this stuff because there's too much of a, it happened, it happened, let's keep moving forward. I think that's pretty dangerous. So we like to do a lot of postmortems, whether it's a deal that we, you know, didn't go the way that we thought it would be, whether we launched a product that we didn't think would be received the way it would be, whether we made a bad decision on a prioritization of something. And this sits in all, in all facets of our business. And then betting big, which, we have definitely, we've done. Um, and a lot of that, you only have, look, you're in, you're in the early infancy of, of you know, fundraising. You don't have many at-bats to bet big. You maybe have like one or two. You don't have the capital to do it. Every dollar you spend, you think of like, that's an engineer, could have been. Instead, it's going to this stupid deal over here. Is this really going to actually make or break for it? So you got to have these questions of, do you believe in it? Do you actually think you can deliver on it? Um, is this like, is this something you can even win out there? Um, like you're going to waste a lot of time trying to get a partner excited about you, try to take a bet on you as well. And so really ask those questions before. It'll give you the confidence to step up when you have been able to answer these ones. And then scope. You know, I think we've gotten ourselves in uh, some jams because we want to do all of these things. We want to do everything. We look at the scope of it seems reasonable, and then the scope creep is like pretty monumental. And so you get excited because we're trying to like, Supernets is a great example. We've been onboarding a lot of folks that are building on Supernets, but now we're a little bit log jammed of, oh man, we might have overcommitted and underdelivered. You can't ever do that. And so be honest with yourself on the scope side. Um, we'll talk a little bit about go to market, but obviously having a plan of not just getting the deal done, but how you're gonna integrate, execute, and launch is really important as well. And then again, do business reviews. We have this great business review forum. We invite everybody to it. It's like very transparent. We talk about a deal that we're going to do. We talk about the cost of that deal. We talk about the expected outcomes of that deal. And everybody gets invited. It's not like a closed door thing because that's where the most learning can happen. It's when we say no to a deal, why did we say no? When we ask questions, that way everybody's learning and everybody's getting on the same page. Um, you don't have any animosity if it's like the gaming team gets the gaming deals versus people that are focused on loyalty and rewards. And then again, um, postmortems. Can't, can't stress enough. Nobody ever thinks about bringing reviews back in to talk about things that have been done, both good and bad, right? You want to learn from both these things. So last, I'll talk about um, 
the flywheel, and then would love to just answer questions. So obviously the way that we've set up our organization is we have a BD team. So our BD team, sales. They're just out all the time talking to folks. They're at events, they're talking to partners, they're talking to anybody of all size, whether it's like uh, you know, one or two folks that are starting a company off a small grant all the way to you know, the largest companies in the world. They're out, their job is just that. Like we have them focus on nothing else. They don't focus on partnerships, they don't focus on anything. It's like you have a client, is that client gonna build with us or not? No, move on to the next one. Yes, send them to, get the deal done, and now send them to the solutions engineering team. That team is very focused, technical team that's really focused on all the answers that you might have when you're you know, wanting to build on top of a protocol. Um, three, making sure after people build and commit and they're actually on your, your platform, on your app, on, you know, working with you, keep them happy. You know, your point of getting them on is literally only half the battle because then they have a bunch of different options to go other places. They can use that as leverage against you, like, oh, I got this other, you know, L2 that's talking to me and they want to do a deal. And so you really have to make sure you've got a, a, a somebody. Look, in your infancy, you might have one person that's playing like three or four of these roles. And as you get bigger, you have the luxury of being able to build these teams out in a more dedicated way. But you have to make sure somebody is on that account afterwards. That's really helping them, making sure that they feel loved. Like, don't think that you're done once they integrate and they start using it. It's, it's, it's a big mistake that people make. Uh, then thinking about how you're just like in, in general engaging with them, how you actually bring some value to them, how you have constant dialogue with them because things are changing in this space. What are you fulfilling for them? What are you providing for them? And then last, just again, it's that retention. So we are trying to bring some of these businesses on and ensure that they not only are staying on Polygon, but they're actually driving success. And so the amount of time that we spend with like a Reddit and Starbucks is actually pretty significant in order to keep driving the traction that we're doing. And so I think when you're thinking about all of these things from start to finish, it's just really important first and foremost that like you have, you have to just like spend the time to build the right folks. And you have to have a great product because at the end of the day, business teams, they're complementary of product. If you have a crap product, it's, it's a, it's a band-aid solution that people are going to call out, right? So all of the business and BD and partnerships work you could ever want to do, if it's on a shaky ground of a like poor product, it's just a matter of time before everything falls apart. I think what's really important for this room, we've been spending more time in DC going back next month. You don't have to be engaged in the day-to-day -day policy conversations, but it is, it is in a place and time where you need to be able to be mindful of it. You need to be able to articulate use cases. And I would say, if you're not, you know, uh, if you really weren't paying attention in, you know, any of these classes uh, in school, you should definitely start focusing on what's happening in this environment and making sure that you're thinking about it as it relates to your company. It's actually really important and tough times right now in that regard. And again, like I said, I'll, I'll say it over and over and over and over again, don't settle on talent. Uh, that's been one thing that has kind of changed us from an uh, organizational and culture perspective and has allowed us to have the success we've had in closing some of the largest companies in the world. And that's my speed run on go to market and BD and happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Great presentation. I'm Locha from Fuel. We're building an affiliate marketing protocol. Um, just wanted to ask you, can you provide um, like a more insights on how your BD pipeline is structured, like from where you source these potential new partnerships, yeah. conversion rates, and you show like a few partnerships, but like how many, like what was the time to close those or how many other partnerships you try, but they are on hold or failed? Like, no, it's a great question. So there's a couple different points of entry that we've been able to see companies, right? Uh, one, we have our venture fund, which is a $100 million fund. Uh, that was part of our raise. So we raised $450 million. As part of that, $100 million of that $450 went into a fund to invest in you know, founders like you all. That has given us tremendous deal flow of just seeing all of these different people that are building in the space, right? Um, so that pipeline's been great from Web3 endemic, if you will, or Web3 native, whatever you want to classify. The other ones that we had to build out, it really was bringing in, it's relationship oriented at the end of the day, right? So when I think about Polygon, it's not like the protocol, our POS protocol was something that was so significantly different from a product perspective. Like, yeah, it was an L2 on Ethereum. I think like a lot of people wanted to be on Ethereum, right? So it was there. 
but you really need to start knocking on doors. And so you have to bring in people that have some relationships. And so the way we first started building out the team was vertical specific. So, you know, gaming, entertainment, and really try to bring in folks that understood Web3 that had relationship building. That allowed us to get the big Fortune 500 enterprise pipeline going. That was kind of a space that we weren't operating in, no points of contact. The other thing that that did for us is when you start to land a couple of those, everyone else called. So like when you, when you land Starbucks, it's like Nike, Nike, Salesforce, everybody called us then. Like, oh, we're interested in Web3. We want to talk to Polygon. We saw you guys just did X. So you can't underestimate that first big bet blows the door off on people reaching out. Uh, DraftKings was a big one for us as well. Shout out, kudos, peers in the group. Um, and so it really is. That's why I'm like, your big bet matters. And that is the only way you start to break those doors down. So it's like, yeah, you can hire and you can maybe find like a good talent that can actually have the relationship. That might get you that first one. But after that, that you know, there's a flywheel that kicks off. It's why we did category bets as well. It's like anybody in loyalty and rewards would be a fool not to reach out to Polygon now because Starbucks is in the portfolio. Um, and so you have to kind of think that way. And so, yeah, it's worth, it was worth, did we spend money on it? Yeah, it was worth it though. Cool, thanks. And a yep. follow up on that one is, do you usually, like, for the first meeting, you already prepare like a case on how, like, a project for, like, a rewards program for Starbucks works? Or you? Yes. Wait for it? A million percent, right? So what we did was like, we believe foundationally in these categories, creator economy, gaming, loyalty and rewards. We had a whole, like we have a whole pitch on why you too should believe in loyalty and rewards and then why that should be on Polygon. Um, and so, yeah, I think making sure that you've got something that's tailored, one, you gotta believe in it, right? So like we genuinely believe in this loyalty and rewards category. It's very broad. And then you start to have specific ones. So like when we talk to airlines, like now we have a very specific break. It's only a couple additional slides in the broader loyalty and rewards one, but it's like very specifically tailored to, oh, Delta United, here's how you should think about it. And so we've built on it a little more even nuanced kind of vertical cases, but yeah, you absolutely should. The other thing too is depending on your, your, your audience, right? So if you're dealing with like a Web3 native audience, they're going to care about you know, TPS and gas and decentralization and validators and all this stuff. And you're talking to games and Fortune 500 enterprise companies, they don't care. They don't care, right? So like, don't belabor these points, right? What do they care about? Focus and hone in on that. I see a lot of founders that don't tailor their message enough, right? Like I, we're having a whole different message with like a, a Web3 founder versus Starbucks on what we're pitching, right? Um, and so adjusting more is really important. And I think sometimes when you talk to some of those big companies, if you're like Web3 native blockchain, you're like trying to pitch this future world, they just glaze over. Like, I have no idea. Like, how's this helping me with my business? You know? So, yeah, hopefully that helps. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, Ryan. Thanks a lot for, for the great talk. Uh, I'm Greg at Narval, and we're building the wallet platform for, for teams and organizations. Um, and so my question is around, um, you know, how you approach, uh, you know, um, cooperation versus competition. We hear a lot about the competition world in, uh, in, in Web3. And yeah, like specifically, for example, with Immutable, who could be you know, appearing as one of your competitors, how did you approach the partnership? Um, who initiated that partnership? And yeah. Yeah, I have a lot, actually a lot of thoughts on this. So I think one, weird, there's weird like tribalism and competition in Web3 that is like actually kind of bizarre. I think everybody is like inherently competitive, but a lot of that I think we could talk probably for hours on why that is and you know it's users that have high affinity or financial motivations or whatever the case may be to a project. But I think then that pushes too many projects to think competitive. At the end of the day, um, it really doesn't matter what any of these other protocols are doing for Polygon's outcome and success, right? Like Arbitrum's doing great things and Solana's doing great things. It doesn't matter, right? Because at the end of the day, we just have to figure out what are our problems on why people aren't building and why are people building? And if you just like hammer that away, hammer that away. Um, I think it's good to be observing and mindful of what people are doing in this space. That's part of the education part for me. So like I pay attention to what, you know, an Arbitrum does. I pay attention to what Solana does. I pay attention, uh, you know, what Optimism does, does. But I think it just doesn't do much for me, right? Like at the end of the day, it's like, oh, that's cool. That's what they're doing. So I think of it more as educational. You just, you've got to build something that people want to use, full stop, right? 
We, and this is a challenge this whole space is, including Polygon, right? And so I don't know what the, like may, I would love to at some point think about competition in a meaningful way when we have 300 million users and some of these over there. It's just, there's no point of me wasting any of my energy on it right now because of the space that we're in, it's so nascent. So I think the more that you can really ignore that, it also leads to bad decisions. You do bad BD deals because you go chase deals, you hire people that you probably shouldn't hire. You overpay them because they're chasing. And just like, it's, it just creates so many bad behaviors. And I actually can't even name anything positive of why you would stay. Maybe a little bit of a chip on your shoulder, competitive spirit, a little bit of fire. It's good for you. Uh, I can't let it consume you. Uh, and at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you don't have anything that's worthwhile. Cool. Thank you. Hey, Ryan, thanks for the talk. I'm Nico from Skylab. And we're actually building uh, on chain game protocol on Polygon. Yes. So, um, yeah, so I, I'm curious, like, because you're from a gaming background as yep. well, right? So what, what's your vision for um, gaming, like, like Web3 gaming in the future? It, that, that's like, I have a lot on that as well, I could say with you. Um, I think there's a couple things. Right now, we take a lot of what we hear in our silos right now is very much like what Western audiences think about Web3. So it's like very anti-NFT, very anti-blockchains, you know, and I think that's kind of just the mental state, particularly in the US. I'm highly encouraged just in general when we speak to game developers in the East. Nexon's a great example. Square Enix also builds with Polygon. They have completely thought about it very differently. And they are still very anchored on the best way for us to generate secondary sale revenue and for people to actually fully own, own these things is building on a blockchain. And we should just get ahead of it because ultimately people are going to push for more of these user ownership rights and then we'll be ahead of it. When you look at like big established game publishers in the West, they just don't need to. They've got a model where the user is in an incredible disadvantaged spot that they monetize that very heavily. It's like Call of Duty Warzone. It's like they just make a ton of money, then they launch another Warzone, you buy all those skins again, right? And they don't want to have to worry about sacrificing that primary sale point for the potential opportunity of what it means for the ecosystem. And they're not, it's not in their best interest. All of this stuff is disruptive, right? Um, to anybody that's serving as any sort of an intermediary. So their game publishers and game developers that are large is inherently not in their best interest to build games on blockchain unless they are having a much bigger thought process and long-term view on it. Hence why I'm super bullish on the thing that's gonna break through in gaming is gonna be from web three endemic companies. Like, yeah, we're in with Nexon, we're in with these big game companies, it's good for us to do that. But like the, the breakouts are going to come from that category. Reminds me even of YouTube, you know, Minecraft. When you looked at Minecraft when it first came out, you're like, this game is a joke, right? Like nobody's gonna play this game. And then, you know, for 10 years, it's the largest game ever on the platform. S small indie team, right? Um, so I'm really bullish on that. Now, the way games, it's gonna be as simple as just NFTs, marketplaces, digital ownership. But now I'm starting to see games where they're doing like really fun concepts of, you know, putting your NFT up in a, a match or a wage or a battle where it could be burned, right? Or it could be taken from the other ones. And then there's a bunch of stuff that we'll have to unpack. There's extraction games where you win the item if you win the game, but like cheating is gonna be a really big problem, right? And some of the issues that happen there. And if you look at games like Valorant and Counter-Strike, the amount of money that they're spending to like, you know, for, for, yeah, for hacking is like really sizable. And so it'll take a little bit for these things to kind of play out. I still think your base is just marketplaces and digital ownership, just being on chain. When you start getting a little bit more cute or creative and clever with the things that you can do on chain to have different game experiences, there are things that complicate it a little bit. Mm, yep, yep. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yep. Hey, Ryan, my name's Adam. I'm building Bello. We're building data tools for the creator economy. And shout out to Polygon. One of the reasons we're here, we've got a grant from Polygon. I love that. This is awesome. Kind of like go through the bear market. So, yes, good. Right? No, good. That's It's important. Question for you. How integral is on-chain data in the day-to-day -day of like managing and executing on these deals at Polygon Labs? So this, I love that. These are great questions, by the way. Um, we, ha we have this kind of we talk about this all the time internally because we want to be like in a more objective driven organization. And so we want to be data driven in the way that we like establish our OKRs internally and everything. But the problem is on chain data is like easily manipulated. It's like can be very deceiving, right? You know, you have like some, you know, some project that launches that let's say is unsavory and it's like boosting your numbers, but it's not the projects you want, but you're like, oh, it's more wallets and you know, transactions and you know, yada, yada, right? Um, so for us, I think, it's the irony of blockchain being transparent but getting poor data. If we got really, really good data, and we aspire to get really good data, so we think about like metadata and smart contracts and all of this stuff and what we can do to get better data, 
we would, we would love it. So like any companies that think about how to provide better, stronger signals from data on chain would be really valuable. The space could benefit greatly from it, whether you're doing like affiliates, whether you're a, a business that wants to be able to assess this data. Um, I would say we try to prioritize it in all of our OKRs and when we do it our all hands and talk about it, but it's always with an asterisk, right? You know, and what we, we ultimately do is we'll look, our data scientists will look at it and we'll have to pull out notes of what you should ignore. It's like, oh, this game launched, this is kind of a bad game, don't think about this. So anybody that works on better, more accurate, meaningful data on chain would be very valuable. Thanks for the, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I'm Nikita, we're stopping scam, with Chain Patrol, we're stopping scammers and phishing. In Love the this space. too, all right. <laughs> you know, all the RuneScape doubling gold and all that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, my question was around when it comes to like MMOs and kind of these games, like building an economy is really hard, even yes. in like a World of Warcraft. Yes. And now you're saying I'm taking this economy and opening it up to this, all <laughs> to all these other economies. And yep. so how do you see, um, one is like, what is the incentive for them, like an MMO to like, to go to make that leap? Yeah. And then uh, how do you see them dealing with some of these challenges with like, you know, destabilizing their own economy because something happened in, in another world. MMOs are like definitely gonna be, like look at Diablo's auction house and that completely ruined that game, right? Um, and that their spirit was in a web three digital ownership. Like they were aligned philosophically with how like we feel about the space. Um, there's a lot of challenges there. I don't know that I necessarily have the answer because the other thing is there's like challenge and opportunity, right? So if you're like an MMO and now you have these this open economy and ecosystem, then like, you know, uh, people can, you know, institutions, venture firms can come in, buy those assets, buy the tokens, and it can really cause a disturbance in the economy. Uh, but I also think as a player, there's a ton of benefit that could happen there as well, right? If you have a, you know, a rare item or you were early in the game and you hold the, you know, the gold coins or whatever the case may be, and now all of a sudden those have become valuable, they can drive it. So ultimately I think it's like how it influenced game mechanics too much. With Diablo, you have a little bit of that. You can just skip any of the grinding and playing just to like pay to win and, and buy, right? Um, so it's so nuanced on here. Um, but I think it's enticing if you're building to see what it's like to actually have an economy where you don't really control it, right? And that you actually just take your hands off of it. So it's it's unique. Like I look at um, um, a game that I invested in is uh, Bright Star, right? Where they actually only have some like some aspects of the MMO, like digital items that are going to be on chain to avoid some of these like disrupt disruptions in the economy, which I think in the meantime is probably some like fractioned approach where uh, you have a lot of it that's off chain that doesn't matter. And for those that want to participate in the like more vibrant economies. The other thing is Crypto Unicorns has done really cool stuff where your NFT basically is like worthless unless you're constantly utilizing it and like actually spending time with it. Because my concern more is people coming in, land grabbing assets and NFTs with money, sitting and hoarding on them, and then you, your cold start problem got even worse. Like now it's like your barrier to entry is miserable. Um, so yeah, I think, look, it's, you guys are in the, you're in this like exploration phase. There's not, there's not answers to it, right? There really isn't. I think there are, this is why it's a beautiful and troubling phase to be in. This is where a lot of the breakout success and companies are going to be. It's like this, you know, early adopters, first movers, and there isn't really a clear answer to MMOs. And the other thing too is you don't even know when you do open economy to like 20 million users. If you get to 20 million users, right? What does that even mean, right? So there's a lot of fluctuations. I think ultimately the people that play and participate in those games are going to have to be much more in tune with what that means. Like, hey, dude, you might buy like a $5 skin that could go to 500 bucks or your coin and currency could get thrown off. Because that's the thing, you choose to be, it's like you gotta take the good with the bad. You choose to do a free economy, you're gonna get a free economy. Thank you. Yeah. I just have one more quick question. Yeah. Like around like hackers and cheaters in these games right now, when you control a database, if something goes wrong, you can just change it, right? Yeah. And how do you think games like Maple Story or somebody else, like how are they approaching, you know, um, dealing with like bad behavior when it comes to like these assets might be hard to move around? Are they putting in some sort of like, you know, override into the contracts where they have like a team that can, you know, that can make changes or yeah, any other. Yeah, so I can't share too much of like what they're specifically doing, but obviously all of the game devs, this is really, they're really focused on it. A little bit different issue with Nexon, who's got a lot of capital 
to focus on you know, anti-cheat, anti-hacking. Um, so I, I worry less about what they're going to do, but like a, a Midnight Society's dead drop game, it's Dr. Disrespect's game. I think these extraction games where there's a valuable asset, it's gonna be really problematic and they probably should be thinking about things. The problem is when you start to do some of that stuff in the smart contract, it's like, mm, like are we really web three and to what extent and so forth. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think when you're putting the object on a pedestal and you're playing to get that object, you're gonna create a bunch of really, I, I don't know how you get around it. I mean, you have to spend tens of millions of dollars annually to really stop anti-cheating and anti-hacking stuff. So I would caution folks that are in the Web3 gaming space that are like early founders to, to not think about like, the, like putting items on a pedestal that you win. Mm -hmm. Randomly giving it away, so forth is it, because you don't wanna do anything where it, in, it invites cheaters to get a leg up. And a lot of games you don't need to. If you're not doing it, then there won't be an emphasis on it. Um, so I think just if you don't have the budget, don't do a game where you put an item on a pedestal. Right, because you, you need to spend a lot on prevention. You gotta spend a ton, Yeah. a ton. Mm -hmm. It's like not cheap at all. Thank you. And, it's, uh, and, and it's not foolproof. It's one thing in like a Valorant lobby where you're spending all this money to sell, and you get one player that did cheat, get through, the RR gets messed up in that room, you can fix it. You know, if they just won the $10,000 NFT item, your community's chalked. They're done with you. Not playing the game anymore. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the talk, Lewis, uh, from Shield Security. We're trying to build tools that look beyond just phishing and uh, smart contract audits. So my question uh, is about employing uh, people and hiring. Can you talk about kind of the pools that you source from and tactics to slow down the time it takes to keep the bar high still? Yeah, honestly, we, I, we've tried it all, so I, can't, I can give some insight. So for executive hiring, um, finding firms that could very articulately speak about the Web3 space was hard, but we spent a lot of time finding them and they were worth it. So we found some that were prestigious exec firms that were awful, didn't get it, not helpful at all. And then we dug into some of the endemic groups. And then obviously you've got, you know, some of the more reputable, amazing VC firms like A16Z are able actually to help with sourcing. I ultimately think at the end of the day, it is like, it's link, like LinkedIn was pretty powerful as well. Um, even putting like job posts on my LinkedIn for roles, people reaching out to our recruiters and then going through it. Um, we would do, we spent a lot of time on just screening like screening, screening, and, and getting people, the tough part is a lot of people always wanna outsource the screening stuff, cause like, oh, you know, it's just you're asking questions, getting to find out. But the thing that we quickly learned is, a lot of good employees ask questions about your company. Like, when did somebody that's worthwhile, they have a bunch of things that they wanna know about Polygon. Um, and so a huge indicator is when you talk to anybody in screening and they don't have any questions for you, it's like just kick them out of the queue as well immediately. So I think you've got a number of things. It's like, one, you have a couple different buckets to source from. I think your, your peers, sharing on social ha is actually a great signal, it's particularly in this space. Um, I think when you are looking for a big hire, it's worth putting a little bit of money into the right firm to find the right person because there are not many of them uh, in the space. And then I think the most important part is, yeah, that like builds your pipeline. Be really, like have a lot of rigor around the hiring process of, Who's gonna own what responsibility, right? Like, are you testing role-related knowledge? Are you testing culture? Are you testing product knowledge? What area of like, there's four of you, which one are you gonna interview for and which one are you gonna own? Get together and do those individually, don't talk about it, and then come together and talk about candidates. The way that you actually set up a process to take these candidates in is just as important as like the work you do to source them. Um, that's why I think like the phone screen, having people that get the company doing it, uh, that can answer the questions, and then actually having a great hiring process is important. These are some of the things, like I try to bring some things in from Google into Polygon, and some was good, and hiring was a good thing, but then you bring other things like over process and too much that can be bad. It stopped us from being agile, so we had to kill these things. Hiring is one that I think was a really good like setup so I, I spend just as much time as you do on the second part as you do on sourcing. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, of course. Awesome, well, please join me in thanking Ryan. Thanks Morris. everybody.